living or dead, name a famous Irishman. Yes. Disraeli. Disraeli? Was he Irish? No. <laughs> I said I want to play For 50 years, game shows have been the backbone of British TV. They've given us some of the most memorable and bizarre moments in entertainment history. Does telly get much better than Belgians in penguin suits slipping their way to knockout glory? It was one occasion in France. I laughed so much that I peed myself. Tonight, we're going to unwrap the crazy world of the quiz and reveal the golden rules that have made the game show great. In the modern English alphabet, which letter comes between P and R? Oh, no, Q, dear. <laughs> Studios and, and lights, they do something to you and they, they frazzle your brain. From the daft to the downright bizarre. <laughs> Nonsensical. Made absolutely no sense whatsoever. These are the telly programmes that made the British public go absolutely mental over complete rubbish. It was a time when it felt like plates could change your life. Speak a little louder so we can hear all the bargains you're picking up, Linda, if you can. So sit down. Oh, oh. Put your teeth in and join us on a dwarf-chasing, money-grabbing, arse-watching, salamander-fighting guide to the ultimate game show. <laughs> it absolutely vandalised itself! <laughs> <laughs> First thing you need for a successful game show? Contestants. In the old days, the laws of television dictated that women had to be shorter than their husbands. That's changed now, but ball guys and moustaches will always be popular. Don't worry too much about brains, they're not really important and sometimes just get in the way. Rule number one in creating the ultimate game show is pick the right contestant. In geography, the River Danube is in which continent? France, Europe. They're in a totally alien atmosphere, so they're going to behave somewhere irrationally. And that's what people are looking for. Your name, please? Philip Warmby. Occupation? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know what it is. A barrier comes down. A veil. They can't see it. People are screaming at it. Here we have a map of Whitechapel. That's another clue for you. Another, the book, The Dissection of the Human Body. Another clue, and this black cloak. Who do you think? Florence Nightingale. <laughs> That's the thing about game shows, you know. The contestants aren't always that bright. I want you to give me the letters of the alphabet backwards, starting, of course, with Z. All right? Z. Um, X. You're looking out into a bank of lights, to cameras, to maybe a floor manager moving around. And, of course, it affects people in different ways, so they don't always think quite logically. Which member of the royal family appeared on the 200th edition of A Question of Sport? Ricky Tomlinson. <laughs> Every game show has had its class dunce, but if you want to see people giving seriously daft answers, one show hits the mark more often than any other. Could it be the conveyor belt chaos of the generation game? <laughs> How about saying what you see? Catchphrase. <laughs> No, of course, it's Family Fortunes. You have to hundred people to name a game you could play in the bath. Annette. Scuba diving. <laughs> Family Fortunes ran for over 20 years with four different hosts. Permatanned Bob Monkhouse, followed by bumbling Max Bygraves, cheeky scouser Les Dennis and, um, him. It was a brilliant format. The whole thing about game shows is that they have to be done properly, they have to be worked on, and they have to be produced properly. But the format for Family Fortunes is as good as it comes. We asked 100 people to name a game you can play in bed. Steve. I spy. I spy. <laughs> the answers may have been stupid, but so were the results of the surveys. <laughs> I spy. The simple format of the show never changed. All the questions were based on a survey of 100 people. <laughs> All right, top six answers in this first game. 100 people surveyed. We've been busy with our survey around the country. My first actual problem with this is, have you ever, in the history of your life, any of your friends' lives, met anyone that was surveyed for Family Fortunes? 
you'd think you'd know someone. Because by those statistics, more people did that than have ever voted in a general election. Did they actually do surveys? Did they actually go out into the street, I want to know, and survey 100 people? We asked 100 people was genuine. We did have researchers who used to go out and they would ask those questions. Something people have more than two of on their body. <laughs> Eddie. Arms. <laughs> more than two arms you've got, have you, Eddie? <laughs> Some of the answers were very, very surprising, but we did genuinely ask 100 people, you know, What's the first thing you think of when you think of Christmas? <laughs> While Family Fortunes has had many unique contestants, one family stands out above all others, the Johnsons. We went with a, uh, a state car, hoping to pick up the odd freezer and the odd fridge, uh, and we didn't. Living or dead, name a famous Irishman. <laughs> yes. Disraeli. Disraeli? Was he Irish? No. <laughs> I said I love the <laughs> A great question, isn't it? Go on. <laughs> Who? Hemingway. <laughs> Hemingway. You get these answers in your brain. You listen to everybody else, and you forget about trying to think about your own answer. As Brian says, your mind races and everything, and you just have to try and think of an answer, and you think of one, and it just comes out. Jenny. Any famous Irishman? Trevor <coughs> MacDonald? Trevor MacDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor MacDonald! <laughs> there were a couple of answers on there that I don't, I don't care how many people you're asked, we would never have gotten. It's as simple as that. James Joyce, yeah. um, Ulysses. Um, I had to go home and look that one up. <laughs> <laughs> Despite thinking that Trevor MacDonald was Irish, somehow the Johnson family managed to make it through to the final round. And they gave the late Bob Johnson the chance to win them the £1,000 big money prize. Big mistake. Name something people take with them to the beach. Turkey. The, f <laughs> the first thing you buy in a supermarket. Uh, turkey. <laughs> Just says turkey the whole time. Turkey. <laughs> the only word this guy could get out was turkey. <laughs> Food often stuffed. Turkey. <laughs> Anything you ask me now, I'm going to say turkey. Turkey. <laughs> Just said turkey all the time. Any famous snooker player. Turkey. <laughs> Well, I was standing at the back and heard this buzzer going, burp, 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 burp. Oh, two buzz. And I thought, what the heck's he doing? <laughs> now, you've got a chance here of making £1,000 and two weeks... two weeks in Turkey. <laughs> and, uh... But why on earth did Bob have Turkey on the brain? As he walked back through uh, the various hands and crew people and then walked back in front of the audience, he picked up the fact that uh, chicken had been an answer to one of the questions. And he, and he got it fixed in his mind, well, if chicken had been an answer, then turkey is going to be an answer or with, with a bit of luck. So he had turkey in his mind, he stood up there beside Max, and by his own admission later, he just didn't listen to that first question. I said to you, <laughs> name something people take with them to the beach. You said... <laughs> the answer was... <laughs> the first thing you buy in a supermarket, the answer was... <laughs> and, and the survey gave you... <laughs> a food often stuffed, you said... <laughs> and that gave you... <laughs> 21! I mean, we came off so embarrassed, Barrist. right? And yeah. the cameraman... I can always remember a cameraman saying to me, he said, if you've made somebody laugh the evening, you've done a worthwhile job. He said, yeah. that's all. We if you, that's it. And I thought, oh, well, I'll have to live with that. <laughs> <laughs> Once you have the right contestants, you need to know what to do with them. Just watching them give ridiculous answers isn't enough to create the ultimate game show. In part two, we'll show you how to embarrass your contestants. Nobody thought about compensation. Somebody had broken a limb, we set it for them and gave them a few bob. They said, I've had great fun. And how to put them in the most bizarre situations possible. When Fern went on that show, she was actually slim. 
vortex affects your glands. She bloomed after that. Tonight, we're guiding you through the golden rules of the game show. So far, we've learnt it's vital to pick the right contestants. <laughs> slap her face. <laughs> but it's what you make them do that really counts. Uh, this poor chap is so tired, he's heartbroken. In the best traditions of British entertainment, we love to see people make fools of themselves. So the next vital ingredient for the ultimate game show is embarrass your contestants. Nice to see you, to see you. <laughs> yeah, I know it's pretty obvious to start with the generation game, but they certainly knew the formula. Take a civil servant, put him on telly with his mum, dress him in a silly costume, and then make him dance. Seeing people who are like, yeah, I want to be on telly, I'll do anything, it's not as good as seeing someone who really doesn't fit, but, well, if that's what you want, I, you want me to do a strongman act in a little leotard, then so be it, I'll join in the fun. Let's get them on telly, humiliate them slightly, in a kind of cheeky, bawdy, British kind of way. But dear old Auntie B wasn't satisfied just humiliating adults. 24 hours earlier, look what they were allowed to do to kids. Somebody call Esther Ranson. It's Friday. It's five to five. So it's... Come on, the jack. It wasn't just a TV programme. It was the end of a week of misery at school. Of course, these days, when you finish school on a Friday, kids would probably go down the park, smoke a bit of spliff and rob a car. But for us, Friday, five to five, start of the weekend, it was crackerjack. We weren't trying to teach the kids anything. We weren't putting them on the spot. We weren't trying to educate them. It was just a minute, hang on a minute, you've been at school all week, sit down, relax, let's have a laugh. The pace was a little slower back in the 1950s when the show took to the air with its original host, Eamon Andrews. In those days, the most humiliating thing you could ever do was drop a cabbage. All the shame. Now, you know the rules by now. You get a question every time you get a question. Oh, boy, you get a prize. And if you miss a question, you still get the prize, but in addition, you get a cabbage. And, of course, you also get a cabbage if you drop anything. And we always know because the floor has got a special noise, as you can... <laughs> If you dropped a cabbage, you got another cabbage. If you dropped a prize, you got another cabbage. Three cabbages, you were out of the game. What are the Great Bear and the Milky Way? Chocolate. They're not chocolate, actually. Um, the Great Bear and the Milky Way are groups of stars. Get these poor little simple kids on. They're, like, starving and hungry. Loading them up with prizes with a stupid amount of prizes, and if they, if they drop one, they don't get to keep the prize? You bastard, Francis, you. But it wasn't just the kids who faced humiliation on the show. The celebrity guests copped a load as well. Resplendent in the period's finest polyester, Britain's top footballer road-tested one of TV's first gunge machines. Grapes! Do you make wine? Grapes! You're right, Stu! Kenny, you're wrong! <laughs> once had Kenny Dalgleish when Kenny was at Liverpool. And Kenny said on the Saturday afternoon that he ran out at Liverpool to the cop, he said all of a sudden about 20,000 voices all at once shouted, Cracker Jack, to Kenny, because he'd been on the night before. And that is the power of the thing. But forget the guns and cabbages. Surely the most annoying thing about the Jack was that it gave us the worst catchphrases ever in TV history. We're so excited, what can we do? <laughs> When I was working in Variety, doing stand-up, I just said it for one reason, in the situation I was in, and people laughed, and I thought, strange, so we sort of brought it in. I could crush a big grape. But, of course, when I was on Cracker Jack, we couldn't keep saying I could crush a grape every week, so we had to sit down and think about others, myself and the writers, and we all started coming up with these other ones, these silly ones, I'm so excited. Oh, I could rip a tissue. Oh, I could scream blankety-blank. Oh, I could roll a biro. <laughs> The thing about Stu Francis is he was really annoying if you watch it now, but back then you were going to school and you were saying, oh, I could crush a grape and all that sort of stuff. I mean, now you'd kick yourself in the head if you came out with something like that. Oh, I could rip a tissue. 
when people can't remember the name, they sort of say, it's you, isn't it? It's you, isn't it? It's, um, crush your grape. What? Do. Uh. If you really want to top that for game show humiliation, there's only one way to go. Take one northern sports reporter, add some men in speedos, and spread liberally with a parcel of penguins. Voila! The ultimate game show to embarrass your contestants. Oh, we're going to lose a horse. We've lost the horse. We've got a knight, we've got a damsel, but we ain't got no horse. First broadcast in 1955, It's a Knockout really took off in the 70s when a velvety-voiced journalist at BBC Manchester was told he was taking over as host. Once upon a time, I was a very serious broadcaster involved in politics and sport, religious programs and all the rest of it. And Barney Colhan, ex-Lieutenant Colonel, Royal Artillery, rang me one day and said, I'd like you to present It's a Knockout. So I said, bugger off. He said, well, I'd still like you to do it. So I said, bollocks. He said, look, you're under contract with the BBC. I said, yes, he said, you're doing it. Three, two, one. Oh, can she complete with the boys? She's in! <laughs> with Stuart at the helm, Britain seemed to lose its inhibitions, and wearing an unfeasibly large suit whilst trying to mount a stranger from behind became socially acceptable behaviour. It's a knockout was great family entertainment. There was a certain time in my life I used to watch It's a Knockout before going to bed and you'd all be there on the sofa. That's the bird of Stimpani. He's got him. Three. These all symbolic creatures. In a way, it's like a big acid trip, isn't it? Right, what's going to happen? You're dressed in an octopus. You're going to use your two front tentacles to catch these oversized eggs. You're going to run while people throw massive spanners at you or some other such nonsense. But brilliant. People were just so game. They weren't naive, they knew what was going to happen, they didn't care, they were just up for it. So, they got a few squashed gonads, hey. Well, It's a Knockout was on in the days before health and safety kind of got a grip on television you know, after, after people started dying on, on other programmes. And some of the th things that they did, some of the games they did, you would not get away with now. <laughs> Nobody thought about compensation. Obviously, we, we had medics on the, on the arena, and, uh, and if somebody had broken a limb, we'd set it for them and give them a few bob. They said, I've had great fun. I've had great fun. Not only was the show popular with television audiences, but thousands of spectators, along with Stuart Hall's groupies, would flock to watch teams from all over Britain humiliate themselves. Well, it's a knockout, it was like a countrywide competition, so you might get a team from Sheffield taking on a team from Bristol. And the best thing about it was they all brought along their local beauty queen. And to be honest, some weeks they were a bit ropey, which Stuart all didn't mind. Here we have Miss Sherwood Forest, would you believe? Look at that. Robin Hood never saw a spectacle like that in his life. We always had to have uh, lovely young girls on knockout because pulchritude has its place in light entertainment. And there's Nothing more beautiful than a very curvaceous beauty queen putting up the scores. Before we go to the points, let us introduce that lovely girl on our scoreboard, tossing her blonde curls in the wind, Miss Dynamere. Didn't matter whether two and two made five or five and five made eleven, it was completely irrelevant. There they were, and they were beautiful. They were really beautiful girls, you know. Absolutely incredible. A rose between Off you go, put some clothes on. Stuart gave the awe of a man who appreciated a fine lady, and I can imagine post-filming Hall would be like, I say, what wondrous breasts you possess, Shakespearean buttocks, and if only I could gallivant through the nether regions of your bra, I think we will unveil the... You can imagine Hall with his flowery language seducing local Miss Bath or something. Oh, do you think so? The winner of each British event would compete in the pan-European broadcasting extravaganza known as Je Sans Frontières. Firemen from Fleetwood would battle builders from Baden-Baden for the right to proclaim their town crazy continental champion. The British need to go through first. If we all get through first, we are through. No, we're not. We're jammed, we're stuck. It's the, the Olympic Games. It's competition. It's fun. It's the joust. It's international. Britain versus the Krauts and the Froggies. Who's over? One of the Belgians is up, one of the Germans is up. Where are Britain? They always have this sort of lingering suspicion of the Germans, like they've they got some technique. This game is all about friction. We have uh, calculated the friction necessary for the raft to sail over the... Uh, you know, it was... They always seemed a little bit better than us, even at It's a Knockout. 
And just in case you weren't sure whether you were meant to laugh or not, Stuart made it pretty obvious. How are we doing? The great Stuart Hall was employed to present that wonderful show and all I can remember for two decades is this. <laughs> As two teams of penguins had battered shit out of each other. It was magnificent. <laughs> It's one occasion in France where I have a laugh so much that I've peed myself. And people say, well, you know, you falsify the laughter to sell knockout. That's impossible. You can't do it. You've got to have something that's really, really very funny. You chuckle and you chuckle, and then you get the belly laughs, and then the guffaws, and then you can't stop. It's just, in fact, you can't stop laughing. So there you have it, my friends. It's a knockout, surely the most surreal game show ever. Well, actually, no. Some producers have made a career out of creating the bizarre and the ridiculous. So be prepared for talking plants, the odd tiger, and a young John Leslie looking handsome in a space helmet. Rule three to create the ultimate game show is make it bizarre. Set on a Napoleonic fort, Fort Boyard was a fantasy world of tigers, dwarves, naked women, a fat guy with a gong, and a perverted old man. No, not him. Him! Oh, right, you've got to start looking over your shoulders, because what goes around comes around. And Joyce, you're my choice. I think a lot of it was quite un PC. At least they covered all the bases, you know, <laughs> with semi clad men and women. So at least, yeah, no, nobody was left out in the um, unpolitically correctness of it all. But to be honest, there are only two reasons why we watch the show. Well, welcome to the fabulous, fantastic, but rather frightening Fort Boyard. I think one of the elements of the show was obviously, you know, they're trying to make it attractive, but that's what happens in shows, you know, that they, they want to appeal to as many people as possible. Yes, obviously, they, they wanted to kind of go down the sexy road as much as they possibly could with it remaining tasteful and decent. In the game, contestants collected keys, which they could exchange for gold from the keeper of the fort played by Leslie Grantham. But often, the show seemed more like his own personal fantasy. Now, my love, you're going on a long journey into fright. Get out of there, woman! Go. Leslie did his role beautifully as the baddie <laughs> and, um, and provided a lot of entertainment, a, a lot of things that couldn't be shown or aired. This contestant accidentally stumbled across Grantham's dressing room. In fact, that actual room where he was done with his finger was in Fort Bayard. No one actually knew that. If you look at the background, you can just see all the brickwork. He did take his, his job very seriously, and he really did go all out to make it as hard as possible. He may be an exposed sex pervert, but at least Grantham could act. It's a skill that shouldn't be taken for granted. Just take a look at this. Ever heard my dog impression? <laughs> woof, woof. Oh dear, John. While John moved on to other video-based projects, game show producers continued to outdo each other in the quest to create the most bizarre show ever. A world away from the simple question and buzzer show, the Crystal Maze brought us studio madness. They kept the daft costumes and added in fantasy worlds, crazy games, and gave us two hosts who are mad as hatters. Baldy Richard O'Brien... Oh, no, you didn't yeah. pick up the crystal, did you? Oh. Yeah, Judging John Hossafat! and insane punk rocker and former Sex Pistol, Ed Tudorpole, who seemingly had delusions of grandeur. I'm definitely a leading man, and I thought, at last, this is what, this is what it's like to be Arnold Schwarzenegger in every scene. You know, I like to take these things seriously. And with the biggest set in Europe, they were determined to make the most of it, even if that meant locking their contestants in it for hours on end. Oh, 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 so is he locked in? Of course he's locked yeah. in, yeah. yeah. Locked I'm sorry. In. 
it was a real punishment. We used to leave them in the cell um, for the duration of making the, well, sometimes for the duration of making the programme. Ooh, this could be another lock-in. As the day took 13 hours, if they were locked in at 10 o'clock this morning, they actually wouldn't have anything to do till perhaps 5 o'clock. So it really was a punishment for them. While incarcerating your contestants may seem odd, it wasn't a patch on undoubtedly the most surreal game show ever broadcast on British TV. This was a programme where you could see Noel Edmonds and Fern Britton grovel to a plant and Keith Chegwin evaporated into outer space. Forget everything you've seen so far. When it comes to making it bizarre, the adventure game was quite literally on another planet. Many light years away, on the far side of the galaxy, in a region often visited by time travellers, lies Ark, a small planet of little... Oh, there's Fred Harris. The adventure game came before Crystal Maze, it came before Fort Boyard, the original and the best, the adventure game. <laughs> First thing to say about the adventure game was it was completely weird. You know, it was like a Doctor Who quiz show. And then they'll... Oh, frightfully sorry. The producers originally approached Douglas Adams to do essentially a game show version of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. However, he'd already signed a deal to do the show as a straight drama. So that's why um, this particular show, The Adventure Game, feels like it's in its own world, it has some elements of Douglas Adams in it. The game saw three celebrities transported to the planet R. There they solved logic puzzles and cryptic clues, all seemingly standard game show fare. But the twist came in the hosts. Out went the blazed supremo, in came aliens. Who spoke backwards? Doogie Rev. Tactical, narrow move, aim low, tab mud. Told you it was odd. Right now, gentlemen, who's going to be next? We were all Argons, and we were all given the names, which were anagrams of the word dragon. For instance, we had Gandor and Duran and Dorgan. One dragon had a particular talent for reading the news. Hello. We've got some more visitors from Earth today, so we've taken their crystal. We'll give it to them back, of course, but they're going to have to work for it. I just remember Moira Stewart being in it. Am I remembering that right? It was definitely Moira Stewart. This testing of alien intelligences has become rather a popular pastime for the Argons. Yep, you are remembering it right, my beardy friend. Moira Stewart was in it. I'll take it down to the caves. They'll be here any minute now. I'll get them started. You think that's weird? This plant is the star of the show. The ruler of the planet that the contestants landed on was called the Rangdo, uh, who basically been metamorphosed into a Aspidistra plant. Because we took it all very seriously, it's only when you turn and you watch your own programme do you realise that you were grovelling to a plant, an Aspidistra plant, who was His Royal Highness. Gronda, gronda, gronda. Um, it's a rather splendid um, porcelain teapot, sir. A porcelain... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, sir, he doesn't like that at all, but as it is his birthday, he will not evaporate you for the moment. To be honest, I find it bloody annoying that people only recognise me for a stupid game show. I've worked with all the greats, you know, Gilgood, Hopkins, Guinness, yet people only ask me about firm bloody Britain. Rock a my baby beyond. I had my own 60-foot Winnebago for Day of the Triffids, you know. Here we are. This is the vortex. Goodness. Each show ended when either the celebrities had embarrassed themselves enough or they completed the infamous vortex. Bye -bye. Oh. And that's when Cheggers started drinking. The vortex game was a fantastic piece of TV because, you know, the contestants didn't know what they were going to step on, but you did. And that's the best thing when you're a viewer, if you know what's going to happen and they don't. Oh. Do you remember the one? where Fern Britton was the captain of one team, and I think actually Fern got zapped. When Fern went on that show, she was actually slim. The vortex affects your glands. She ballooned after that. 
embarrassing your contestants and putting them in bizarre situations makes for good viewing, but beware, don't be too mean or nobody will ever appear on your game show. So in part three, we'll reveal how to keep your contestants happy. You've won a 21-inch colour television. Oh, my God. In a magnificent mahogany walnut surround. It was the happiest day of your life. And we'll also show you how to attract those people on the fringes of society. Good morning from the Scottish Exhibition and Conference Centre and welcome to the semi-final of the Great Egg Race.